We had our crossover Thursday. We thought we'd keep that energy going with Aaron Nagler from Cheesehead TV. He joins me on the show today to talk about the status of Matt LaFleur, the most disappointing part of this 2023 season. And just because we like to have a little bit of optimism always at all times, something that he's noticed that he's really liked about this 2023 Packers team. All of that on today's show. Let's get it. You are Locked On Packers, your daily Green Bay Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet and the show for fans who know what happened. They want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the code all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. I thought at this point of the season, my midway through here, it was a good time to check in with Aaron Nagler from Cheesehead TV about all things, really, Green Bay Packers. Um, Packers Twitter, which has gone to a dark place. Uh, Matt LaFleur. A lot of stuff. There's there's a lot of things to talk about with this team right now, and we are going to dive into all of it on... It's November now, so let's, let's make the transition. We are now talking about a frigid Friday. So let's do it. Joining me now from Cheesehead TV, you know him, you know who I'm talking about. Aaron Nagler is here with me, and and for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, uh, yes, it does look like I'm wearing an Aaron Nagler Halloween costume, unintentional, but uh, here we are. Uh, Aaron, it is great to be with you. I wish you were under better circumstances for the Green Bay Packers, though, <laughs> right. um, but right. that gives us right. plenty to talk about, and it, it just... Let me just start here. Um, Packers Twitter has become a dark, dark place. How are you reacting, <laughs> How are you reacting to that right now? St- become a dark place, sir. Well, that's true. That's sir. True. Um, oh, well, you know, the dark underbelly is exposed. Let's let's put it that way. Um, yeah, a lot of soft people, man. A lot of soft <laughs> people. That's all I know. A lot, a lot of people, a lot of brittle spirits who who couldn't have survived the 70s and 80s, I'll tell you that. No. I understand. It's a, it's a team and a fan base that is very used to winning. Um, actually, Corey put it perfectly on Packer Transplants last night where he said, you know, we make fun of, we've got the shirt at Cheesehead TV, welcome back to the 80s, which, you know, is meant somewhat in jest. But he said, we're not really back to the 80s until we get in the mindset of when the Packers win a game, it's like they won the Super Bowl, like just any game. And, you know, hey, this losing streak continues on and maybe they don't win another game until like December or next year, then maybe we'll be there. But right now, it, we're, we're not there yet. There, there's a lot of ball game left, as someone once said. I have heard that before. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you look at some of the underlying problems that this team has, um, I asked this question to our pal Lily Zhao a, a week or so ago, and I said, in in whom on this offense, or, or not this offense, on this team, are you most disappointed doesn't have to be a person. It could be a, a group of people. Right. But what is what is your answer to that question as we sit here early November? It's got to be Matt LaFleur. It mm. has to be Matt LaFleur. I mean, it, it all starts and ends with him as the coach and his decision making as far as bringing back Joe Barry uh, and not seemingly wanting to change any anything having to do with his approach despite you know, losses piling up and the same types of losses. That's the key here. Like, it's not like they're losing multiple different ways. It's the same script each and every week with seemingly no changes. You know, I mean, it took um, eight games, seven games for them to finally pull the plug on the Rasheed Walker experiment. Although who knows, maybe he's back out there on Sunday against the Rams. But and this seems to be Matt's fatal flaw. Right, This idea that he has faith in people. I have faith in Rasheed Walker. I have faith in Amari Rogers. I have faith in Mo Drayton. 
well, man, you need to find a new religion because this faith is not getting you anywhere. So, yeah, I, there's obviously a ton going on here, right? There are multiple kind of levels to why this team is as dysfunctional as it has been throughout this entire losing streak. But, man, it's, it, it starts with the head coach. It's his job to get this fixed. And right now, I, I haven't seen any signs that we're any closer to fixing it. Yeah, Mike McCarthy had some similar problems, right? Was loyal to Dom Capers. Right. Um, there were players that that it seemed like he was loyal to to a fault as well. This is in, in part two, just a coaching thing. Like their it is willingness somewhat, to say, we're yes. going to be patient. Like Mike McCarthy right. was right to be patient with Mason Crosby. That turned out right. to be a brilliant move. And so I'm, I'm sitting here trying to go, to your point about the 80s, it's been seven games. Can right. we just, like, I understand the five-game losing streak or whatever it is now sucks, <laughs> but like for whatever it is, four games, right? Four, four games. games. We're up at, uh, five was last year, man. We could beat the record. We'll see. And they started very similarly. So that's yep. why it's even more distressing. Cause it's like, they're kind of following the same script that they did last year and what is going to change. So let me ask it this way. Then mm -hmm. what do you think can change? simplification sounds like such an easy answer here, but I think it's the key. Um, we heard it from Aaron Rodgers last year, and I think he was right. I think he'd be right this year. Uh, I think when you watch, especially on offense, what they're being asked to do with so much youth on that side of the ball, both yeah. up front uh, along the offensive line, and then especially, of course, you know, when it comes to the pass catchers, I just it feels like, and this is what I mean, when I, it feels like Matt is adamant that, and you know, I've talked about this a lot on Packers Daily, that this is our offense, this is the way we are going to work, and the guys just need to play better. And I understand that to a point, but at some point you got to start getting, you got to start putting up some Ws, right? I mean, if for job preservation, if nothing else. And I think the one key here is, you know, I, mean, I think we heard a little bit from Brian Gutekunst on this yesterday, where, you know, they're they're, I mean, you want to say they're close, although I don't know how true that is, but. The, <laughs> We know the talent is there. It's just a question of cohesion, and hopefully banked reps will get them there. I don't know how much patience is in the building for that. I mean, I'm assuming a whole lot because, like I said, not much is changing. Um, but you have to think the repetition hopefully gets them where they need to go because, again, it doesn't look like the approach is changing. But if there was one thing they could do, I think it's simplify things. I mean, we've got so much static spread stuff. It's like McCarthy never left. Like where where I would spam the hell out of like these boot action rollouts, right? It's one it's the one play where Jordan actually looks pretty comfortable, and good things usually happen off of it. You know, I'm not saying you have to do it every play. You can't do it every play, but a lot more of it I think is in line and would help your quarterback and help your offense as opposed to so much spread where you're asking five young guys to go out in patterns and you see uh, every week on the tape the spacing's bad hell guys can't catch the ball like yeah let's, let's simplify things a little bit the the mccarthy never left stuff is is uh, I, I wish that weren't such an astute point because it, it is hard to watch at times where you're just like it's weird wh right? why, why is it's nothing happening weird. why is nothing going on here and i, I just i i I, some in some ways, I'm like, did did Rodgers just like red pill the floor? Like, well, is that what the, happened? That's I mean, right? I can't explain it any other way than all of the influence that we had, you know, pegged up to Rodgers being well. This is clearly Aaron running what he likes from right. Mike's playbook has seemingly been held over. Like we were so excited on the outside looking in to finally get back to some of that stuff we saw in 2020. A lot of condensed formations, bunch sets, rub routes, like shallow crossers, all sorts of motion. That's been sprinkled. Have they in run a shallow a cross bit. with Christian Watson this year? They did one time. Oh my God, it's so funny you asked that. They did it once, and uh, Jordan passed it up and ran instead. Like I've been screaming for it all year, and the one time they finally run it, Jordan's like, "Nah, I, I got this." But that's my point. Like that's the stuff. I thought they were going to lean into. Well, it's the but stuff they did they camp. Leaned, it's the stuff they, they did in into, like, McCarthy stuff. Yes, that's the other point. What? Go back and watch the openers against the Bengals. Where's that? Totally different. It's I really effective. It. It's really good for your young players. I understand it's preseason. I understand the defense is different. But, man, let's run our stuff. Let's run the stuff we know these guys can uh, hopefully actually, you know, complete. Rather I do, than, I do I mean, have, it feels like we're trying to fit, fit them into something yeah. that they're not. 
All right, more coming with Aaron Nagler from Cheesehead TV after this on Locked On Packers. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It could not be easier. You pick two to six players, you take their stat projections from Prize Picks, and you decide if those players are going to produce more or less than the projections. That's it. And you can win up to 25 times your money. That's pretty easy, right? Pretty easy. Two to six players, two, three, four players, five players, six players. You don't have to go nuts if you don't want to, or hey, let's let's go nuts. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Prize picks is so simple to play. You can submit your picks in less than 60 seconds. Plus quick, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. This is a, a no-brainer, guys, because right now. When you go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the code locked on NFL, Price Picks will match your deposit up to a hundred dollars on that first deposit. They will just give you money. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the code locked on NFL for that first deposit match up to a hundred dollars daily. Fantasy sports made easy. That's prize picks. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Football season is here and Locked On is kicking up our coverage with Locked On NFL Kickoff Live. Each Friday, Locked On will go live at 2 p.m. East on every Locked On NFL YouTube channel. Host Tanitra Batiste, Jarvis Davis, and Kyle Krabs will break down every game on the NFL slate and get you ready for your team's matchups, your fantasy lineups, your betting angles, and more. And guess what, guys? I'm hosting this week. I am filling in as the host of the show. So come hang out with us. We're going to have a blast. Plus get the in-depth local analysis from our stable of NFL hosts across the country who know these teams better than anyone else. Also me and all of our great local Locked On hosts. Find Locked On NFL Kickoff Live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern on any Locked On NFL YouTube channel. I have half an answer for this. And it is, if you go back to 2019... When the offense was not quite in right. the same sort really of rhythm that it jerky, got into, yeah. right? Part of the reason why I remember what they what they would say every week. Aaron Rodgers talked about these get back situations. Oh yeah, and then oh, and yeah. that was when they were like, okay, let's just go run the 2013 Packers right. offense, right? And and I feel like second and twelve so often, yep. or second and nine, or third so and often, sixteen, yeah. Right. You're, it's like you're not. They feel like you they can't have be running be bootleg in these yeah, yeah, yeah. situations. But I was also right. disheartened when you hear Matt Lafleur say, "Well, you know, we we couldn't get into some of the, you know late down situations. We couldn't get into our stuff. It's like then run the good stuff on first down, please." <laughs> well, okay, but here here's my thing. I've been kind of hammering home on daily. Like, yes, that is a frustration, right? But man, I I have real kind of trouble yelling at the play caller when what do you run that you know your guys this aren't going to they can't even up. run inside zone Aaron that's my like you're running duo on third and one and you 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 got one guy doing his job up front like as a play caller you got to be sitting there going okay it's a 50 50 chance that this is going to be blocked correctly forget the quarterback hitting his drop and making the right read and guys having the correct spacing and actually catching the football forget all that because before any of that can happen, you got to be right up front, and they are not on any given play right up front. So, I, like, yes, I, it's frustrating as hell, and I'm like, I'm with you. Like, get to that stuff early, man. Like, it's your only chance. You're not going to be. You're going to be down twenty four nothing in the blink of an eye every week. It's, so it's gotten to the point that I have been begging for them to run the RPO receiver screen that I hated for <laughs> three years with Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Right. I'm just like, can you please run this? This looks. And by the way, oh, it would have man. worked like every time they called it against the Vikings. If they'd yep. have thrown it every single time, it would have worked every single time. Right. It's just one of those funny things. I want to. I, I threw this at at Lily. Mm-hmm. I'm going to throw it at you. I, I did. I tweeted out my manifesto about it, but I'm going to try and explain <laughs> it to you. Okay. Um. That I, I have this idea that Matt Lafleur. What does he say every time at the end of a press conference? It's on me. It's on me. Yeah. I, I I do wonder if he's taken this a little too much to heart and he's trying to put out the fires everywhere. And as I've, a result, I saw you he has not successfully put, out, put out any yeah. fires anywhere. Right. And I just wonder if he's stretched himself a little too far and 
in a, in an in, in, in the interest to maintain the continuity and the control, he's Peter principled a phrase I hate. Mm-hmm. Some of the people in the organization beyond maybe what their ideal place would be. What just yep. like in principle, what do you think of this idea? I, I it's hard to say with any kind of you know definity because of the fact that we're not in the building, right? And right. I do. I'm think, just trying to read some tea leaves. Right. No, I hear you. And look, the whole kind of move from Mike Pettin to Joe Barry was somewhat about this, right? He wanted to be more involved. He wanted to have more say on defense. Although Joe runs the defense. It's like, it's not like Matt's calling, you know, any of the defensive plays, but he's much more involved in game planning than he was. That's what he said anyway. You know, we can only take him at his word. My thing is like, is that a possibility? Absolutely it is. But I just, I don't know what's going on inside the building. And I've tried to, it's funny you say that because I've tried to get, any kind of like kernels out of people that I know at 1265 Lombardi and th- nobody will say anything, especially during a losing streak. I get it. Like I understand it. it it's a possibility, but it, I always say this and I get this. I'm sure you get a lot on, on your social or your chats or whatever. I get people who always want to like f- obviously fire everybody after every loss, but it's always like, well, this position group is doing poorly. So this assistant coach has to go. It's like, I don't know what we don't know as a general public, what they're being tasked with, what they're teaching. I understand, man, you watch this offensive line week after week and you're like, what are they doing? What are they being coached? And I'm sure there's some validity in there somewhere, but without knowing exactly what that coach is teaching and what is being stressed on the practice field and then what is not translating to game day, well, without that information, yeah, I can't call for someone's firing, you know? So it's, I think it's why we're so bad at hiring coaches, Aaron. Like there, there really part is of it. no part track of it. record of, it's not just like, Hey, the best assistants right. who do the best jobs. Yeah, it's mostly networking. Like, it's mostly networking. Yeah. That well, I mean, and that, it's also just not true that the guys who are good assistants make good head coaches over time. We've seen oh, it no, that fail a hundred yeah, right. times. Yeah. So it, that's, I think this is exactly what you're saying is why it's, it's almost impossible to know what is translating and what isn't. And you're, you're kind of just trusting your head coach to know yep. what they need and what they don't. Uh, this, this Russell Douglas trade, I, I have to get your reaction to this because um, it was a move that I did not understand people calling for when it was happening. People are like, sell, sell Russell Douglas. I'm like, I, that's the last person that I would want oh, yeah. to leave no. this locker room yep. regardless of cost. But right. so I, I think you've sort of taken the, I hate it, but I get it. Yep. kind of stance yep uh explain that because I just hate it I hate it because of the fact that he's the one dude who brought it every week and has showed up and is an absolute dog on the field like yes has he give up some plays sometimes sure but at least he's going like Matt always talks about he wants people going a thousand miles an hour if you're gonna make a mistake make it a hundred miles you know it's like we saw it in the Detroit game they took advantage of his aggressiveness but at least he's aggressive you know and more often than not he's making plays he's tackling he's sniffing out trick plays like the guy had been balling out. I get it because exactly what Brian said. Like at some point, you start looking at the big picture. You start looking at the savings you're going to get cap wise. The idea that he just turned 29. Yes, he's a he's a good player and one of your best this season. But you are building for the future, and that's what this is absolutely signaling. I don't love getting rid of good players, but I get the idea of trying to open a new window, which is what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to open a new window of contention. Now. The trouble becomes, well, okay, you're still dealing with major cap issues into next year. Yes, this gives you a little relief, but it ain't like things are just magically opening opening up on the salary cap next season. You are still going to have to be a predominantly draft and develop program. And right now, one of the reasons you are sucking as much as you are is because your drafts in 2019, 2020 absolutely blew chunks. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, like, exactly. So, like, the you got to start hitting on some of these guys. And I think they have uh, actually have started to. Like, if you look at, I think Quay Walker has played well this season. I think Devontae White has quietly had a good year. You look at, I mean, Dobbs and Watson have to turn it around this season, but I think there's still a lot of promise there. You know, development, progress, it's not linear. Some guys take a step back before they take a step forward. Look no further than Devontae Adams back in the day. You know, so there's still promise there, right? But, man, you got to start hitting on these drafts because that's the core of your program. And right now your core is rotten because you had such terrible drafts. 
I think if you look at the 2022 draft, that just seems like uh, even if even if the guys mostly stay as they are, it seems kind of like a home run draft. Like Zach Tom is a better than it's player. been, man. Better than it's been for no sure. Doubt. And so, no doubt. yeah, I, certainly better than, than the 2021 draft, which right now is a complete just throwaway. Like yep. he, he Brian it against practically took the collar well, the on thing. that one. There's the thing, though. It's like plenty of GMs have bad drafts, right? Yeah. But they are way more Ooh, active Schneider. in every other facet of roster construction. You know what I mean? Like, so, okay, I understand you're a draft and develop program, but if your drafts suck, you have to be a lot more proactive in fixing and finding those cracks and papering over them. And I understand they're limited because of they had to, they kicked the can. That was a decision collectively as an or- organization that they made to try to get back to the Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. Well, now they're paying that price. But, man, yeah, again, you trade an array, a good player in Rasul Douglas, great, you got a third-round pick. I really hope you trade that pick to move up in the draft because God knows I don't want Brian Gutekunst making any more third round picks. I yeah, an extra third it. round pick. I don't need it in my life. I don't need it. <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to business here with Aaron Nagler from Cheesehead TV in just a second here on Locked on Packers. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at DoorDash, an app that I use about as much as any app in my phone, to be honest. It's like, Social media and then DoorDash. Like that's the the hierarchy in my life because I love to cook, but I don't I don't always have time to cook. I have two kids. And so I I I need to feed my family. So I use DoorDash. And sometimes when I am cooking, I might forget an onion. The other day, just the other day, I was making guacamole. I forgot cilantro. Guess what? DoorDash can bring it to your Door. Score football season's best deals on groceries, restaurants, and yes, retail, and even more. Get prepared before game day. Stock up on your favorite appetizers and order all your tailgate gear on DoorDash. Then get ready to watch your team win. I don't know how many times I need to tell you, Toppers Pizza is the way to go if they are in your area. My goodness. I mean, it is, it is. The topper sticks are my weakness. They are truly one of my weaknesses. Get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. LOCK23 is the promotion code. Up to 50% off that $10 value when you spend $15 or more on that first order. Subject to change and terms do apply. And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Uh, the Jordan Love experience, um, how how have you found it to date? I mean, it's hard, right? Because everything's such a clown car around him. Uh, he does have, certainly, bad throws, questionable decisions, stuff you'd like, man, I, I'd really like to see him improve there. And then you get to the next week, and it's kind of the same story again. And you're like, oof, I don't know about that. But that said, I also have seen a guy with a ton of athleticism, a ton of upside, and make some really nice throws where guys have just dropped it or they hasn't been on the same page with his wide receivers, which is to be expected, right? Um, what I keep feeling, and no one is with me on this, but I, I will swear – to my grave, that this is how I feel when I watch him. I feel akin to how I felt watching Brett Favre when he first got to Green Bay. Not in the way that they actually play the game, but just the frustration of, what are you doing? Like, I I must have yelled, what are you doing at my television watching Brett, like, a thousand times in my life. And it feels like every Sunday at some point I'm looking at Jordan Love going, what are you doing? But at the same time, again, I see throws where he's making – the throws necessary. What last week he had what six plus drops. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, can we help this young man? Lafleur said they bit? had more, and I was like, "Yeah, you. Right. I, could, I could get to like eight. If you, I know. If you yeah, being... depends on your grading. Depends on yeah. what you're saying as far as contested goes. But like, look, can we help the young man just a little bit? I mean, if they're in another third and sixteen because of a holding call or a uh, illegal formation or whatever, <laughs> it's like I'm gonna scream. Yeah, like. People are like, well, he's got low percentage. Well, no kidding, because he's always trying to make up for third and 100 yards. I and mean, the worst we... contested catch receivers in the league by in the league. percentage points, it's it's bad. They're top five in drops and the worst contested catch group in the league. Mike Renner on our, our new show, Renner Ranks, made the case they have the worst ball skills in the league right now. Which, like, I mean, that's uh, per um, the tape. Sure, yeah, 100%. Here's yeah. what's frustrating, though, is that we've seen them do it. 
that's got to be killing like Vrabel and Lafleur and like, because we've seen it. I've seen it in practice. I've seen it in preseason games. Hell, we saw it in games last year from you know Dobbs and Watson. It has just evaporated. Like that's my point when I say like guys just got to play better because we know they can do it. They got to do it. And we're gonna see. I thought Aaron Jones had a great point. Like we're gonna see who really wants to play now. Because yep, the, the season has sort of slipped away from them a little bit. And, of course, that's Aaron Jones' mentality. That's who he's proven himself to be. Right. A lot of guys on this roster have not proven themselves to be anything at this point. I want to end on a high note. Okay. Um, because we've done a, lot of airing, done a lot of airing of grievances sure. uh, so far right. on this one, which I knew he would. But uh, I, I came away Sunday so impressed with Jaden Reed. And, and he was the leading receiver on the team. He could have gotten a couple more targets and it would have been even more impressive. I do wish he would have made the play in the contested catch situation against Josh Metellus. Metellus was unbelievable on Sunday. He had a good game, yeah, definitely. Give me your silver lining so far of the season, whether it's a player, whether it's a, an idea of just like, hey, this has been this has been fun. I've enjoyed this. TJ Slayton. Slayton mm. balled out on Sunday, man. Yeah. And look, we, we've talked so much about draft picks and like, I think... You know, Devontae White gets all kind of the conversation because he was a first-round pick. But, you know, Slayton is kind of the forgotten man. And I thought not only did he play really well on Sunday, I think he's quietly had a really good year. And it's kind of interesting that we've spent so much time saying Kenny Clark needs to get some help. I think they've finally gotten Kenny help when Kenny is finally slipping. Like, it's really – I'm trying to keep it up here, but, like, we finally got some guys around him. Kenny's not having a great season. But TJ no, is not. actually balling out, man. For a guy that size, some of the plays he made on Sunday as far as, like, running down ball carriers, tackles for losses, I mean, it's exciting to watch him when he's on the field in both aspects. And he's not a pass rusher, but he's making things happen. Like, he's causing disruption in a way he, he certainly wasn't earlier in his career. So, for me, yeah, TJ's been kind of a, a pleasant surprise this season. I like that one. Uh, he he was certainly, I, I didn't think he had been as impactful as I thought he could be to date, but he's also adjusting to a new sort of full-time role. I mean, they're letting him play the nose. They're letting Kenny Clark play a little bit off. Right. If there's going to be a, a case for me to make for Kenny Clark, it's he's playing a different role. He and, is. And, and that I think is going to take some adjusting. He's still young enough to me. He's still I think he's still 24 years old. No, he's not. But it's, <laughs> it seems like he is. It does feel like it because every time every we year. get any kind of mention of him, it's like Kenny Clark is still only 24 years old. Like, yeah, it feels exactly. like that. Yep, I think 100%. he is still only like 28. So I, he takes really good care of his body. I know he trains really hard. I, I know it, I've had his trainer on the show here. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful that he can get that going. We just need these guys to win more of their one-on-one -on -one opportunities. Like when they're in obvious passing situations, whether it is, because I think, again, I think Devontae Wyatt's played well this season. I think he's quietly having a good year. There's just no splash plays. There's no big plays that make you go, oh, look, yeah, Wyatt, he's really balling out, right? I think he, Kenny, all these guys up front, they have to take more advantage of these one when they get them, their one-on-one -on -one opportunities, because that's where they kind of have the all pressures, no the sacks group yeah. too. Because Rashawn yeah, Gary's always percent. been a high pressure guy, low yep. sack guy. A lot of Devontae that. Wyatt, even in college, was a super high pressure guy, but had like two sacks last yep. year at Georgia. But you're like, oh, every play he's creating. He's disruption. right there. There's he's pushing the pocket. Yep. It's yeah. like the pressure is happening, but yeah, they just if they could just break through once in a while, it, it they, it would really, I mean, hell, it would really help down a distance wise because then they could get to third and long and Joe Barry could play 100 yards off and they could just rally <laughs> yeah, they and could, miss the tackle. They could give up 15 yards on third and 16. It'd be great. Looking forward they got to them it. right where they want them. All right, right. Well, we'll see if we'll see if Brett Rippon can do something on Sunday against that Packers Lord. defense. And if he does, God that's help me. Like, us remember all. the Jason Garrett Thanksgiving game? I got that vibe. That's what that's what I'm feeling. Rippon's going to come in there with those receivers and just throw all over the yard against Valentine and company. That does not. Um... That does not make me feel very good, uh, <laughs> Nags. I appreciate it though. Um, well, um, hopefully just it does not. It real, Peter. Like just that. keeping it real. Yeah. No. Listen. Uh, I don't. We're, how else can we do it? And we gotta laugh. We gotta laugh. Otherwise, yep. what are we doing here? So exactly. appreciate the time as always. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Peter. All right. Thanks to Aaron Nagler for joining me on our frigid Friday, our first of many, because it is going to be cold. In the Midwest, in the Northeast, in the Pacific Northwest, now for a long time in the mountains, if you're in the mountains, if you're somewhere else where it's going to be cold, it's going to be cold here now for a while, like November to March in a lot of places that are listening right now. Shout out to you because 
This is when it gets tough. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, we will be live after the game on Sunday, baby, on our YouTube page, Locked on Packers YouTube page, so you can stay Locked on Packers.